Hi people, okay, we're back again with another video. Today we're going to be covering traffic congestion, a very, very important part of your Team 3.2 Sustainable Urban Development team, right? Okay, this is a very, very important topic. Why? Firstly, it has never come up before for an exam. Secondly, it is somewhat simple, somewhat difficult to manage. So without further ado, let's jump right in. All right. Causes of traffic congestion. You have all seen traffic congestion before. We have all been in one. There are basically two types you need to know for your syllabus. First one, there is recurring. Second, non-recurring. Two main types of causes of traffic congestion. Firstly, recurring. Under the recurring category, you have got a few reasons. Firstly, you have got insufficient capacity and secondly, unrestrained demand. Take a look. Read first. Read through the, what I've written. Alright, for insufficient capacity, what actually happens is that there is really an insufficient capacity on the road. Okay, so this is when demand exceeds supply, right? When there is an increase in sheer number of vehicles, such as during peak hours, what happens is that there is basically no space on the road for cars at all. So, an example of this would be in Bangkok, whereby there are over 5 million vehicles on the road each day. Quite crazy if you think about it, over 5 million vehicles on the road each day. So a huge reason to actually back this up is because of an increasing middle class uh, affluence that there is all across the world, right? With an increasing affluence in the middle class, people are going to have more disposable income. When they have more disposable income, there's going to be a rapid rise in car ownerships. Why? Because it is kind of like a, uh, it's like a prestigious thing to own a car, right? You'd rather take a car than a bus because you can get from point A to point B faster. And it is also kind of like a wealthy, um, it shows a level of status quo that you have. All right, the next other factor that we have that is a cause of traffic congestion is because of unrestrained demand. So there's a need for transport which results in the increase in supply of vehicles. This tends to refer to your public transport or either that private hire cars, right? You know, this nowadays there's Grab, there's Uber, there's Tada, there's all sorts of private hire cars out there, even taxis, right? So when there's a lack of public transit measures, this will actually cause an increased reliance on private cars, hence, causing um, greater traffic congestion. So this is basically due to your unrestrained demand that there are on private cars. So on the other hand, non-recurring is like the name suggests, non-recurring. That means it doesn't happen so often. So this one tends to be more like incidents, weather events, or special events. So incidents tends to refer to, like you would know, traffic accidents, correct? So for example, that um, one I can give you here that I've searched that will be in Shanghai in 2014, right? There was over 100 accidents and 900 deaths, which is insane, right? In just one year. Okay, so whether accidents can happen as well, not in countries like Singapore. Singapore, maybe there was that time there, but there was a huge flooding. If not, this tends to usually occur in other countries whereby there is heavy flooding um, because of, let's say, monsoon season in Delhi, India. So this is where Synoptic Link can also come into place, right? You can talk about your southwest monsoon, your northeast uh, monsoon, which can affect um, the traffic congestion due to increased flooding. One more thing could be due to, let's say, uh, hailstones or uh, glacier melts, whatever, in certain of those colder countries. And lastly, you've got special events, which is because of things like when there's a leader's conference or either that due to when a celebrity is in town, right? There will definitely be road blockages so that they can, you know, move throughout the traffic smoother. But as a result, that will cause you inconvenience instead. So what are the impacts of traffic congestion? This is the second part of the syllabus they need to know. There are basically around three main impacts, three to four main impacts. Right? The first one is economic impact. So economic impact comes in the form of direct and indirect costs, right? Whereby direct costs could be literally due to accidents, so that can have an economic impact on some people, or even uh, on on a direct impact on let's say companies because there is lesser productivity. Or the indirect costs, right? In the in the form of when governments want to try and curb traffic congestion, they may actually increase taxes on the road, or they may increase taxes in a certain something, you know, so that uh, more people uh have to use public transport and less people can actually afford to use the road. So this may actually affect their lower income households, right? For instance, people who really, really need to travel very, very far distances to get to their workplace, but because of increased taxes, they have to pay more, right? As a result, these lower income people have lesser income, lesser disposable income at the end of the day. Moreover, there can also be indirect costs, right? Cost doesn't always have to be money. It can also be in the form of productivity, right? When more people show up late for work, right? There's going to be lesser um, output per man hour. As a result, this would lower productivity as well. 
So for example, in USA, there was 150 billion per annum incurred from tra- um, traffic congestion. This occurs almost every year due to the huge, huge amount of time that is wasted when cars are stuck in the traffic. Okay, so a social impact that we have over here is very, very simply health problems. So whenever you look at social, you're looking at people. So health problems would definitely occur. Why? Because of things like your respiratory diseases or lung cancer, which is kind of like connected somewhat to environmental impacts due to the release of greenhouse gases of your pollutants that all the smog that is coming out from your car. So this can lead to poor air quality. Um, for example, in in cities such as Beijing or Shanghai, right, where there is rapid traffic congestion, right, there's a lot of pollution such that you can barely even see or make out what is in front of you in um, those cities. Okay, another thing would be that traffic congestion increases commuting time, hence reduces time for social interactions. As a result, it leads to a loss or lower quality of life. So this is more on a uh, standard of living aspect, right, whereby because you're wasting so much time in traffic, you can barely spend much time um, with a family or either that to, to do the things that you really, really enjoy. So social impact is more of a very, very simple, logical-based reasoning. That is how you actually derive at these impacts. So the next one that's actually a bit more important would be your environmental impact. So this is where it really packs a punch, right? Because you've got so many impacts that um, traffic can actually bring about. Right? When traffic are piled up, it, there's going to be a lot of fumes that are released from the cars which are waiting in line and all that kind of things. So firstly, you can have an impact on ecosystems. So there is traffic-related mortality whereby, for example, when you have got accidents with uh, animals, right, that's, that can actually reduce the species um, that is available out there. Moreover, um, you need, in order to make roads, right, or to clear the roads for traffic, you may also need to affect the wildlife pollution, uh, population, right, whereby they have to relocate all that kind of things which may not suit um, all these wildlife instead. Okay, next is a no-brainer. You've got emissions of pollutants. I won't go through this. And then lastly, you've got noise. So noise is also a form of environmental pollution. It can then lead to social impacts. So this one is more of a joint uh, venture with social impacts instead. So then after that, we come on to talk about what are the strategies that you can use to ease traffic congestion. So there are, main, there are three main approaches to this. Firstly, it would be your supply fix. Oops. So firstly, it would be your supply fix. Secondly, it would be your demand-oriented uh, policies um, or strategies and then lastly would be your non-transport um, initiatives so supply fix is very very simple it is basically referring to trying to fix the supply that it is that there is on the road then your transport system management right will be your demand so how do you cope with the demand the unrestrained demand that is occurring on the road and lastly would be other measures that do not fall within demand or supply so the first and the most important policy you need to know, you have to really go and study this by heart because it is so, so, so important, would be to promote public transport. The good thing about public transport is that it can be very, very, very successful when well developed. In fact, there are thousands and thousands of examples, not even, maybe not thousands, there are a few examples in the world whereby certain cities have a very, very robust public transport such that basically almost everyone uses public transport. Okay, we'll talk about it later on. And one thing about public transport is that it is like a two-pronged approach, okay? It is a supply fix and a demand-oriented policy. Why? Because by providing more public transport, you're actually increasing the supply of your public transport, your buses, your trains, your rams, uh, trams, right? And at the same time, you're fixing demand because more people are going to start demanding for this instead of cars. So your, your unrestrained demand can now actually become restrained. So an example that I have for you, which you may have already heard of if you studied this, would be Curitiba in Brazil. So Curitiba has a very, very reliable and very, very convenient public transport system with only a single fare system. So it is also socially sustainable. Moreover, there are separate lanes for both bus and cars and has pedestrian-only streets. Right. So this is a very good example. I will show you a picture after this. But before that, let me just talk about the limitations is that public transport does depend on the mindset of people, right? If you're going to be filthy rich, you are still most likely not going to want to take public transport. So you must really have a very, very good and robust public transport in order for the mindsets of people to actually change. Sometimes it could also break down. It can also be unreliable. You look at Singapore, SMRT, um, LTA, right? Sometimes it can be a bit unreliable, but that is just a minor issue. 
So this is what I'm talking about, Curitiba, whereby they have got specific bus lanes in the middle over here. Very, very cute. And it's straight all the way. And their bus stops are at the side of the thing, which is very, very interesting because it is where um, where the, the cars are at as well. And not only that, the cars, there's only two directions. It is very, very convenient because that way, um, cars aren't turning left, right, center, everywhere. It is very, very easy to actually drive around. Okay, so the next strategy I would suggest would be usage restraint measures. So this would be to actually forcefully put an end to the amount of cars on the road. So you can use congestion charging, you can use things like road pricing or either that auto restraint. Auto restraint is basically what it does is it bans cars from certain parts of the city during certain times. So during peak hours, certain cars with certain car plates cannot um, assess certain areas of the city. So in the case of Singapore, all of us know this, we use ERP, no doubt. This one all of us know. In UK, they also use foot pricing and it's actually in fact reduced traffic by 15% and congestion by 30%. So go ahead and know these statistics. I'm already giving you the examples. I'm spoon feeling you. It's good for you. Just go and learn it, okay? But there are some limitations. Why? Because there may be equity issues. This one is uh is unfortunate right but as a result of increased prices on the road there could be equity issues for the lower income hence making it not socially sustainable moreover there may be higher costs to even monitor or even start the necessary infrastructure that is required such as your erp or any of these congestion or auto restraint measures that are required so next would be your ownership restraint. So this one is to put an end to the number of owners of cars on the road so ownership ownership restraint what it does is to put quotas on, ve- on the number of vehicles. So it is targeted at taxing car imports and additional documents or charges to reduce the affordability of cars. So Singapore, you also notice you've got COE, Certificate of Entitlement. Without this cert, which is very expensive, it is impossible for you to own a car. So likewise, it can also spark equity issues because of the high costs and moreover, certain big cities, right, or either that cities with a lot of natural resources and those cities which actually manufacture their own cars, they may not need to even import cars to begin with. So this becomes, uh, it doesn't exactly become a feasible strategy. So next will be your non-transportation measures, flexible working arrangements. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, this one is a very, very interesting one because why? It doesn't really work, but I want to include it so that you can show somewhat a balance, right? Whereby you can say that even though, yes, I do feel that non-transportation measures are good, there is a lot of limitations, right? So what it does is to seek um, basically work patterns, right? It wants to capitalize on, on the companies to say that, okay, in order to free up the roads, you maybe let your people, you know, do work at home, that kind of things. Okay, but the only thing is that as you should already know, right, there's barely, there's, there's really barely any companies should actually do this, right? Because they are afraid that their efficiency or productivity will be affected. So they rather, you know, people still come to work, but at least they work from 9 to 5, 9 to 6, they still get their work done that they need and help to contribute to the growth of the company. So one other strategy that could be more effective would be promoting alternative transport. In fact, this is actually a very, very good solution, except okay that this one also requires infrastructure. So for example, using of bicycles, right? Amsterdam, has, they have created bicycle lanes for bicycles to actually use, okay? And this does not contribute to congestion at all because it's com- a completely separate lane. In fact, a lot of people in Amsterdam use this. But in certain cities like Singapore, where the roads are very tight, it may not exactly be feasible to do this. And one more thing is that if you want to use such methods, such as bicycles, it does require a huge change in mindset and may not be feasible for big cities, right? Because if it's a big, big, big city, you can't expect someone to be riding 100 over kilometers just to get to their workplace. They may have to drive instead. Maybe 100 km is a bit of an exaggeration. Maybe 50 km. Right? It's crazy if they're going to be um, riding all the way there every single day just for work. Okay, so once again, we come back to our exam requirements. Firstly, you need to be able to explain the causes and impacts of traffic congestion. This one is very, very simple. I've already gone through your recurring, non-recurring, and then impacts is just social environment and economic. Then you need to discuss the strategies and acknowledge that you need to tackle both the demand side and supply side to traffic congestion. Right? Once you tackle both sides, you should be more or less okay. And how do you tackle these both sides? Use the two-pronged approach of public transport. So lastly, you just need to make sure that you make use of criteria for evaluation, such as sustainability and stakeholders. Right? Sustainability, why? 
is it a good tech criteria because public transport is the most sustainable out of all right when you want to look at as you're looking at this topic right you're looking at sustainable urban development you want to make sure that the policy you employ is the most sustainable across all three aspects which i've covered in the previous video you can go and check it out i'll leave a link in the top right corner of the screen and lastly as well for stakeholders because why lower income groups have to be taken into consideration the elderly also need to be taken into consideration so you have to factor in all these into account when it comes to evaluating such that the policy that you propose which will most likely be public transport as the best policy is actually indeed the most feasible then lastly make sure you substantiate all your points with very very strong concrete examples and you should be good to go for traffic congestion so over traffic congestion is actually a very very simple topic you just need to make sure you understand the different policies and use all your knowledge that you have you already have to actually just throw in some examples that you know are good enough for whatever the strategy is all right yeah so if not that is actually all i have for this video as well okay be sure to give it a thumbs up as well as subscribe to the channel it really does help me out a lot um as well as leave a comment uh, or question if you have any okay i'll be sure to answer them almost immediately if i can whenever i see it if not to the next video um keep working hard and i'll see you guys very very soon bye bye